Hi everyone, it's Joanne Levy here. I was a guest speaker at South Caulfield Shul for their Lunch and Learn, talking about why I, as a USA Today bestselling author, became a why, why I decided to become a synagogue president. Um, Thank you to Rabbi Mendy, and he recorded the session, but somehow it got lost in cyberspace, and I had so many people asking to see it, people who were unable to attend today's session, and uh, because I couldn't give them a copy of the recording, I'm making another one. So I'm back in my office, and I'm going to record my speech, so for those who missed out, they can still get to hear it. So we had a fantastic turnout today. I think there was well over 50 people. It was amazing. We had people from South Caulfield Shul. We had people from Sasunya Huda Safari Synagogue. And we had some friends and family. So thank you to everyone who attended. Um, it's a shame that it was not recorded because we had some fantastic questions at the end. And there was also a beautiful introduction by Rabbi Mendy, which we are missing. However, you'll still get to hear my talk. So I'm going to dive in. I did work from notes. Uh, for those who know me, I do use notes. Uh, but with something like this, it's quite long. I'm definitely reading. So here we go. So my talk today was about why I became a synagogue president. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. As a guest speaker, you hope that people attend and you have more than your husband and mother-in-law in the audience. I thank you all for honouring me in attending today's event and I'm relieved to see so many friendly faces. I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end of my talk. I would also like to thank South Caulfield Synagogue for inviting me to be a guest speaker at their Lunch and Learn. I'm very grateful and thankful to Rabbi Mendy, Rebetzin Lifshi, and the synagogue president, Harold Goldberg, for making me so welcome. I usually get funny looks from people when they find out that I'm a romance author and also a synagogue president. They're not too sure what to make of me. Why am I a romance author? Because I love it. I love reading, I love romance movies, and I love reading romance novels. And when I couldn't find what I wanted to read, I started to write. My first few books were a learning curve, and it took me nine years of hard work till I was ready to be published. In six years, I've now got over 30 published romances. I run a business, and I'm a USA Today bestselling author. It's a great gig. I love what I do. So why become a synagogue president? Here is my story. I grew up in a warm, happy Egyptian Sephardi home. What I thought was normal wasn't so normal for many of you here today. My mum is an incredible cook. She made beautiful dinners as well as biscuits and cakes. Hearing conversations that were a mixture of English and French was the norm. Sometimes they started in English and finished in French. And my parents were always inviting people into our home. My parents were from Egypt, as was my family in Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide, and a large circle of family friends. We ate food like rice, full, molochea, do'a, basbosa, menena, horayeba and rosket. Our home was adorned with beautiful Middle Eastern brass pieces had these on display at the synagogue today. As well as stunning wood pieces embedded with mother of pearl. Being in a Middle Eastern shop with Arabic writing and Arabic music playing in the background is more familiar to me than walking into a Melbourne kosher caterer with babka and meat clops. At Rosh Hashanah, we enjoyed challah dipped in icing sugar rather than apples and honey. And of course, we ate rice at Pesach. We attended the Sephardi Synagogue in Sydney, where everyone helped out and the ladies baked the most amazing meals and desserts. I still have very vivid memories from my childhood of tables laden with beautifully presented foods. My parents and both grandmothers had worked tirelessly for the synagogue for years. In fact, my parents were founders of the synagogue. The Sephardi tunes and Minhagim were our norm. 
I didn't realise things were different at other synagogues. <coughs> Excuse me. This is who we were, Jews from Egypt, and I was proud of my heritage. Fast forward to the mid-1990s, I was newly married to a wonderful man whose background was exactly the same as mine. My lovely mother-in-law is also an amazing cook. Her, her home ran the same as my mum's. Inviting guests where all were welcome, plenty of food and lots of Middle Eastern delicacies. I felt very much at home with my in-laws as their background was identical to mine. Again, I didn't realise how different we were until I started mixing in with those of the Melbourne Jewish community. It was then that I felt different. I didn't know Yiddish. Herring is unpalatable. And it seemed that everyone's heritage was from Eastern Europe. The foods they ate, the way that they embraced their Judaism was very different to mine. When our eldest son was a baby, my husband joined forces with a few friends of his age, creating Song, Sephardim of the next generation. They were determined to rejuvenate our generation of Sephardim, and I was proud of my husband and what they were trying to achieve. We returned to the Sassoon Yehuda Sephardi Synagogue and were warmly welcomed. I suddenly felt at home. The older ladies reminded me of my own aunties and they showered me with love. I was enjoying the foods of my past and grandmothers were nonnas, not boobers. And suddenly I wasn't different. I was like everyone else. Moving to Melbourne away from my family and friends in Sydney had been very difficult and I struggled with the separation for years. I miss them a lot. But these wonderful women, they included me. They made me feel welcome. And suddenly the synagogue felt like home. I felt like I belonged. At the time, I was working in corporate as a business analyst and also a project manager. My boys were toddlers and I started helping out in the synagogue with the shopping, schlepping, cooking and the events. In 2012, the then rabbi encouraged me to join the synagogue committee and this started years of organising of events, fundraising, catering for religious events like Shavuot and Sukkot, cooking and a lot of busyness. The role suited me. I never had any intention of becoming president. But at the 2018 synagogue AGM, the then treasurer advised that the synagogue did not have the funds to continue and options of selling the synagogue were considered. With the then secretary and treasurer stepping down after years of managing the synagogue, I felt it was the right time for me to become president with a brand new committee. I didn't want the community I was now part of to no longer exist. I knew I had the expertise to successfully run the synagogue with my financial, analytical and project management background. But I had ideas that were very different to how things had been done previously. I came up with the ideas of having two rabbis, that we would employ an outreach rabbi to work with our society rabbi, Rabbi Benji Kessley. It was a crazy idea and I went to see Rabbi Benji privately, not even my husband knew, although I did tell him after. I had no idea if Rabbi Benji would throw me out of his home, but I spoke to him. I told him of my strategies for revitalizing the synagogue and was very relieved when he embraced the idea. I would never have gone down the path unless Rabbi Benji was in agreement. Together, we sought out a rabbi that we felt would be a good fit for our synagogue and community. I then created a new committee and at the 2019 AGM, I stood for president and presented a new direction for the synagogue. I had fundraised the money for the new rabbi. I was very excited to start working with the new committee as well as the rabbinical team. I need to add here that my husband thought I was complete nuts. I was against the idea of me being president, not because I couldn't do the job, he was worried about the old guard, of them not being able to let go of how they did things and accepting change. He was right. I knew he was, but I thought that I could manage it with kindness and showing respect for the work that they did over the years. They had stepped down. So now it was our turn to take the baton, so to speak. I asked them for support and to mentor me. And I looked forward to a smooth handover from one executive team to the next. I truly believe that working together for the betterment of the synagogue was the way to overcome resistance to change. With my corporate background, I believed in working collaboratively. 
The Kehila accepted a female president and us having two rabbis. The outreach rabbi and his family were warmly welcomed and they were the perfect fit for us. The two rabbis and I worked well together as a cohesive team and things started to go well. After years of decline, the synagogue started to rejuvenate. I remember standing at the Ne'ila service in 2019, looking around and seeing a synagogue packed with people, something I had not seen in 10 years. It was at that moment that I knew that my crazy idea wasn't so crazy after all, and that the synagogue was on the right path to success. Unfortunately, after nine months, the majority of my committee still did not support my vision, but I was determined to continue working with them for the good and benefit of the synagogue and the members. I understood that we as an organisation and community were going through a massive change, but I was implementing strategies to deal with the resistance I was facing. As Niccolò Machiavelli said, there is nothing more difficult than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order. Back in two, uh, sorry, December 2017, we were told that unless a miracle happened, the synagogue would not have the funds to operate. The committee knew this, but like in so many corporate organisations, they resisted change, despite that the change that I was driving and implementing was being embraced by the majority of the Kehila. I had been inspired by the positive changes of this synagogue, South Caulfield Hebrew congregation, and what they had gone through in the last few years. I knew that such significant change in our synagogue would be challenging after years of being on the synagogue committee and 20 plus years of corporate and analytical work, I knew we had to change to survive. It was the only way. In February 2020, when I had secured the salary for the rabbis for the year ahead, I faced opposition from my committee. And within a few weeks, there was no president and there were no rabbis. At the beginning of the COVID pandemic, the March 2020 AGM was postponed and the synagogue was managed the way it had been done before I was president. I was very much against it and did not support this direction. I may not have been president, but I was still a member of the synagogue. With the world upside down in 2020, I spent the next six months working tirelessly with other volunteers, providing outreach, free meals and support to those in the Jewish community. Ironically, many were members of the synagogue. The AGM was rescheduled for 30th of August 2020 and against the advice of most, probably everyone, I nominated myself as a candidate to be president. Why would I do it? My husband said I had performed well as president. I should be proud of my achievements. Let it go. No need to go back. He wanted me to return to being a full-time author and forget about the presidency. I knew he wanted to protect me. He was right. Did I take his good advice? No. I went back for a few reasons. The main one being is that I believed members had a right to voice their opinion on how they wanted their synagogue to be run. Did the community like my idea of two rabbis with a focus on outreach, events and programs? That was the vision that had been presented to them when I was elected president in 2019. Or did they prefer the other way? With no outreach, no events, no programs, and religious services being run by the Minyan. The then committee had a candidate running as president, which meant the community now had a choice at the AGM to have a say on how they wanted their synagogue to move forward. The community elected myself as president. They wanted what they had had for a year when I was president in 2019. They wanted their rabbis back. They wanted events and programs in addition to religious services. As the majority of the committee did not support this, they resigned from the committee. They and others then chose to leave and splintered from our community. This is disappointing, but they know the door is always there and sorry, the door is always open if they wish to return. Thankfully, a number of members stepped up and helped me form a new committee. And together we showed leadership, unity, 
professionalism and care. We inherited a number of challenges, but they were addressed with priority and we worked hard to heal the turbulence from the past few months and move forward in a positive way. As Zig Ziglar says, you can't go back and make a new start, but you can start right now and make a brand new ending. Seven months after I was re-elected in April 2021, we were delighted to announce that Rabbi Benji was returning part-time and would be responsible for religious services and kashrut. We now have a charity affiliated with our synagogue, FOSI, Friends of Sasun Yehuda with a DGR status. That means that donations are tax deductible. FOSI was set up to provide kindness, outreach and care for those in the Jewish community. But with the COVID lockdowns, we've been focusing on providing kosher meals for free to those in need. In fact, last month, we distributed 600 kosher meals in four weeks. That is an incredible feat for such a small synagogue. And we've done amazing work within the Melbourne Jewish community, and we've achieved my dream, having a charity to help those in need and to do outreach. As Zig Ziglar says, you never know when one kind act one word of encouragement can change your life forever. And on so many occasions, I have seen the positive impact of FOSSI has made on so many. I may not be able to change the world, but I can change the world for some. We are blessed to have wonderful friendships with this synagogue, St Kilda Shaw and the Sydney Safadi Synagogue. I have a network of synagogue presidents, rabbis and community leaders who help me and support me. Without them and my committee, I couldn't do what I do. I do want to add here that the committee are not made up of yes people. They have differing opinions. We don't always agree, but we do so respectfully. It's why I'm so thankful to have people on the committee who are successfully running their own businesses as well as differing age group. It provides a good balance in representing the Kehila. Over the past year, we've run religious services, celebrated Hagim, provided gifts to our members, showing them how valued they are, and we've paid all our bills. We have a new website, we have social media, our kitchen is under Kosher Australia. We've had COVID-friendly Kiddushim and also social events. Our synagogue is beautiful spiritually and physically. We've laid a new foundation for our community, which is very different from the past. I'm thankful to the majority of members who have shown commitment to the synagogue, the committee, and myself. You can even feel the positive energy when you walk into the building. And I think this is miraculous, considering we've had to deal with six COVID lockdowns in 18 months and less than 100 financial members. As Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. So where to now? In the next two years, we will have the following. A new Sefer Torah in June 2022, a bar and bat mitzvah program, a pre-married couples program, more religious services and more events. A memoir of our members' stories. I really want to capture the stories of our amazing seniors and ensure that they are documented. Also, a cookbook of recipes from our members with a story attached to the recipe. These two projects are really important to me so we can honour those who have had an incredible stories to share and I hope that these projects will run soon. It is staggering to think that four years ago we were told that the synagogue couldn't survive and we may have to sell the building and look at where we are now. Keeping in mind there is no and has been no white knight with a checkbook that came to our aid. Being a president is not an easy job. It's challenging. I work 30 plus hours a week as a volunteer. It impacts on my ability to write and to be an author. There are times I just want to stop and other times I just love what I do and I'm totally driven. As an author, I work alone. I have online friends and readers. So not only do I write, but I manage the social media, newsletters and publishing of my books. It's a wonderful job, but I do work alone except for my beloved dog as my assistant. Being a president is very different. I work with a lot of people and enjoy the social interaction I have with my rabbinical team, committee, kehila, and people who are integral to the synagogue, the caterers, security, cleaning, maintenance, 
I am surrounded by an incredible group of people. I would like to add a special mention here for my husband and my sons. They didn't choose this path, yet me being president has had a significant impact on them. As with all leaders, the family is affected. I didn't expect to have such an impact, but I'm thankful for their love and support. They have gone above and beyond to be there for me and also the community. One of the most challenging parts of my job is not having a full-time rabbi. My strategy to rejuvenate and grow our community hinges on an outreach rabbi. So now I'm trying to fundraise the monies so yet we can have yet again two rabbis. That was my vision in 2019. It is still my vision today. This talk was, why do I do what I do? Why am I synagogue president? And why do I do this job? For many reasons. We must have a thriving Sephardi presence here in Melbourne. We can't forget that until the early 1960s, there was no Sephardi synagogue, no Sephardi services. We have it now. We can't afford to lose it. It's too important. I also want to ensure that the Sephardi community here in Melbourne becomes vibrant. It was almost gone with members leaving our synagogue in droves over the years. We were a dying community. I also do this job for the love of my community, community because I haven't forgotten what it was like to be lonely and about the ladies that welcomed me when I needed friends. And I want others who are lonely to experience the same friendships and warmth that I have been blessed with. Over 1 million Jews were displaced from Arab lands since 1948. We can't forget their stories or their suffering that they endured. Our survival, the survival of our community means that we must remember and honour our past. As Sephardim, our foods are different. Our minhagim are different. Our pronunciation is different and our tunes are different. It's more than just eating rice at Pesach, but we have so much to offer the wider Jewish community. We welcome everyone into our synagogue. It's not just for Sephardim. It's for everyone and anyone who likes the way that we do things. As for my writing, I still write, but just not as much as I used to or want to, and I do miss it. Last year, in 2021, despite the COVID lockdowns, I was able to publish three books and became a USA Today bestselling author. It's not easy. I'm still trying to find a balance in my life. Hashem had a plan for me. I will always be able to write books, but this work, leading a community forward, had to be done now. It couldn't wait. At the time, I didn't understand why I went back nominating myself in the 2020 AGM. It wasn't logical. Why go back to work with a committee that didn't agree with my strategies or support my vision? What my family wanted was for me to simply tell the people my side of the story, accept the committee did what they did and move on. I knew they wanted to protect me, but there was more to it. I wasn't simply able to just get over it. It was a very distressing and difficult time for myself and also my family. By returning as president and doing good work, I was able to heal myself. By healing myself, I was able to heal the community. That was my path. That's what I needed to do. Each week, I read the weekly parasha insights of the late Rabbi Sachs. For Parasha Vaera 5781, I honestly feel like Rabbi Sachs had written it for me. I keep a printed copy in my handbag so I can read it from time to time. Rabbi Sachs wrote all about leaders failing, that the path to good leadership is marred with failure. You can't climb without having fallen. As a leader, things can't be good all the time. We are tested, we stumble, we fall. But to be a good leader, you need to learn from your mistakes. You need to refuse to be defeated and treat failures as a learning experience. By getting up after stumbling, it's the only way to become stronger, wiser, more determined. As Jim Collins writes, success is falling down, getting up one more time without end. This journey over the past three years has been marred by frustration, hurt, and disappointment. But I believe I am a better president. I have learned from the ups and downs from the journey that I have traveled along. As it turned out, 
Hashem hadn't buried me. He'd planted me. There's still so much that I want to do. In addition to our outreach work, we will be starting a care program under the umbrella of FOSSI, which shows care to women who are struggling to get pregnant, dealing with pregnancy loss, and also for new mums. I'm currently in the process of creating a living museum in our hall, showcasing Middle Eastern pieces, including family heirlooms and beautiful Judaic art. We're also creating an online store selling Judaic art, which will not only showcase and pay artists for their art, but it will be a fundraiser for the synagogue. And I really want to ensure that in the next five years, the plight of the Jews expelled from Arab lands is included in the Jewish studies syllabus of Jewish day schools, because currently it is not. My younger son is currently doing his roots project at school, and the focus is on Ashkenazi Jewry. It sounds incredulous, but it's almost like the Melbourne Jewish community doesn't realise that Jews come from other countries outside of Eastern Europe. Not all of us eat Cholent, Kugel, Kefil to Fish and say good Shabbos. And I'm very excited to share with you that the committee have just endorsed for us to have the plans for a Kolel, a place of learning, but with Sephardi learning, as well as education programs that will teach both adults and children about their cultural heritage, something that has never been thought of or even considered. As Zig Ziglar says, if you can dream it, you can achieve it. I thank you today for coming, listening to me speak. I am very grateful. Thank you. So that was my speech that I gave today. Uh, as I said, there were lots of questions and unfortunately we don't have uh, copies of it. But one of the questions was, where do we get our recipes from? So I thought I'd share that. So we have our wonderful Keshe magazine that comes out every year. This is this year's Keshe magazine, thanks to Paul Berman, who's been the editor. And we do include recipes in here. So that's where we get some of our recipes. We also get it from this amazing book, Awafi. This is from the Sydney Safari Synagogue. Absolutely brilliant. And for those who came to the dinner and Sharon's fam Sharon and her family did the cooking, the recipes, the mum's recipes are from here. And that's what we enjoyed on the Friday night at the Shabbat service. The other one, the Claudia Rodin. Highly recommend. Anything by Claudia Rodin is amazing. And I have her other book here. Fantastic. And then I have this one. So funny story. I bought this for a very good friend of mine. Turned out she already had it. So I scored it. <laughs> it's fantastic. Beautiful pictures. And uh, this is from those from Rhodes, from the island of Rhodes. Um, yes. So I hope that helps. And I will be uploading this video soon. So thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. If you have any questions, you know how to get in contact with me, president at safadivic.com. Thanks. Bye.